a little bit of a chance to check out your band. And it reminded me more of like a downer, like corrosion conformity than like Black Sabbath. I think you described to me a little bit as Black Sabbath. Uh, possibly, but I could see corrosion of conformity. I mean, I think both of those are a little bit heavier than okay. uh, what what Chief is, but it's pretty much just a three piece three piece hard rock band. Well, that it had the heavy like doom, like Black Sabbath sense to it, but it, it seemed like a. I don't know, maybe it's because it didn't have that Aussie voice. <laughs> so it sounded more like a Pepper Keenan voice or something like that. I, I mean, I can definitely see that. I can definitely see that. Okay. It, it's definitely got its own thing. It's, you know, that's, that's, uh, it's always tough with, with bands as you're always, especially if it's something nobody's heard before, you're trying to find a comparison. Yet, it, yet it, in many ways, it's very much its own thing so it's it's hard to hard to necessarily draw those kind of parallels to right, well, it sounds what exactly you know exactly like another band which is not a good thing it, right it is kind of hard to say well it sounds like this because you're like well these were my influences but that doesn't necessarily mean that somebody else that doesn't know your influence is going to grab that off of it right well and in any any time you're in a group setting mm-hmm. like that it's it's not just my influences it's the influences of the other members of the band each of their influences also kind of are pulled into the mix and but uh yeah i really uh was proud of what that uh group had accomplished in terms of especially in terms of songwriting and uh you know the live shows we did we did play were always a lot of fun was uh, CRC or Down at all an influence, or is just that was more of a happenstance because you were influenced by Sabbath? I think it was probably more of a happenstance. I, I think that, <clears throat> the, like the last time we spoke, uh, you know, we touched upon <clears throat> classic rock, and I would say that band was probably influenced by a lot of classic rock or uh you know that kind of new wave of british heavy metal sound so i i guess i would throw bands in there like deep purple ufo saxon maybe even a little iron maiden (laughs) yeah as a three-piece right Well, the, the vocal struck me a little bit more as like, well, actually, the whole sound struck me a little more as like the COC versus Iron Maiden. Because Iron Maiden is like very clean and polished. Like to me, I, I actually, they're more clean and polished than I like. Like I like bands that have a little bit more of a, like a rougher or buzzed out or fussed out edge to them. I've, I've found me personally when I'm listening to uh, heavy metal or punk a lot of those bands, I really like their first album best, and oh, usually it's yeah. because yeah, and usually it's because the uh, the the recording quality is much lower, so it does sound a lot rougher, which With I think that suits that style. Comes across, yeah. Like I, I think I think it's undebatable with some bands like like uh, Black Flag, like their collection. The first four years, I think, blows everything else away. Like even Rollins agrees that. Yeah, uh, you know, I think you have uh, a little edge, especially when you're younger. A little bit more of an attitude, right? Trying to get it together, and and not to mention the fact that a lot of times bands, their first record, it, it took them a while to get into the studio or to get enough money or to get a a deal. And in that time, they've written a decent number of songs that they can pick and choose for their first record, putting like the best of their material together. And then frequently, you know, they want to have the second record out a year later. So now they only have one year to write that material. So it might not all be as good as the material that was on the first record. Yeah, and they want to... They have something that grabs you to get it out there so they get picked up as opposed to like, yeah, let's just keep this train running. 
you know, and uh, who did I tour with? What were the best receptions? What was played live? You know, it's more like, you know, distinctly them than what they think the audience is going for and stuff like that. Yeah. How do we make the most money? <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully not everyone's like that, although I think a lot of people are even when they think they aren't. Yeah, yeah. Well, you you most you almost have to be to keep to keep it going. To keep it right. going, you got to be trying for something. I I think uh, a lot of people compare our vocalist to uh, like Thin Lizzy. Okay, Phil Phil Lennart, uh, I think was a big influence on uh, Chris, who was the vocalist and guitar player for that group. Okay. Yeah, I, I think it, like I never, I never hold it against bands when they sign the majors. I don't hold it against authors when they go with the bigger publisher. Like as long as they stay the same and they're not trying to match something that they're told by marketing sales, then you know, good for you. You're making money off of it. Absolutely, absolutely. I know. I would, I would, I would sell out in an instant if it. You know, if it meant I was actually earning my living creatively. <laughs> well, that, that's it. That's it. That's the constant, like, you know, ebb and flow between what makes money and what you really want to do. You know, and sometimes they kind of match up and sometimes they kind of don't. Yeah, for me, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think I've all, most I've, people they don't, you know. Yeah, I've always been amazed that the things I make money at are things that I I feel like I'm really not good at this at all. <laughs> Yet somehow people are willing to pay me to do it, and the things I feel like I am actually good at, I can't get anywhere. You know, I can't get any traction at all. But it it is is what it is. You know. I think Rollins was saying that like he was like I'm not an actor. People pay me all this money to be in movies. I can't act. You know. So it's like, but that's where the money is. Yeah. Well, clearly he's, he's done m many things, right? Right. He's done many things, right? Well, I, I think, I think he's a, a smart guy, an introspective guy. I'm not a huge fan of him as a singer. Like I, I like black flag a lot, but I think he was the worst singer for black flag, but they also, that's kind of when they went to their like weird experimental, like black Sabbath on even more drugs, you know? Yeah, I, but I think he was a great front man. No, it's true. Yeah, you no, know, true. so so that's where you get that. Uh, and and man, he's a great storyteller too. He is, yeah. Especially now, you can I can just listen to him talk almost endlessly about a variety of topics. It's he'll, always he'll talk about going to Bed Bath and Beyond. He'll still make it clever and funny. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Did you read Get in the Van? What's that? Did you read his book, Get in the Van, about his days with Black Flag? I have not. I have really not. Really good. I would definitely pick it up. I you believe know, it. I, that, I believe and, you. Um, Johnny Run wrote a book, John Lydon, you know, he wrote a book, um, and he's Irish, and at the time they were heavily discriminated against. So the name of his book is what they saw in all the pubs. It says, No blacks, no Irish, no dogs. And that's the name of his book, The Black Snow Irish for Dogs. And it's a pretty awesome story. I'll, I'll have to keep that in mind. So, was being a musician more focused of yours, or was being a writer, or did they all kind of go together? Early, uh, I was a musician first before, mm -hmm. before writing. And what had happened is uh, I was very frustrated with the uh, lack of progress muse in music music it's uh, it's very tough working with a band because you need to have three four five six people basically all on the same track and the same state of mind and all focused on the same target and it's it's just very difficult because People tend to get involved in different things and they don't want to pursue it the same way other people do. And eventually I had gotten really frustrated and 
uh, stopped playing music. I actually sold all my gear. I was completely done. I was forget music. And then for a while, I returned to art, which was probably my first creative love when I was really young, was drawing and painting. And I started doing that for a while. And I realized, unfortunately, I just fell in love with everything that I was painting and I couldn't bear to sell it. So I ended up with paintings that I wasn't going to sell. And then eventually I turned to writing as uh, my next creative endeavor. And after I'd done that for a while, I returned to music and was playing music and writing for many years at the same time. And right now I'm not in a musical project outside of, you know, messing around at home a little bit occasionally. So I've Are kind you of moved in, my uh, focus. Metallica or is that just like a, you do only feel like it? I played with Metallica from 2009 to 2019. Uh, that situation arrived because I knew their bass player at the time in 2009, and he and I were really good friends. We grew up together. We were in our first uh, punk band together. He was playing guitar in that band, and I was playing bass. So that's in was in probably 1984, 1985, and he was having him and his wife had just had a baby and Vitalica had booked a tour. There was a West coast tour and a European tour. And I'm pretty sure his wife did not like the prospect of him <laughs> leaving town for a month while and leaving her taking care of a infant. So they just asked me initially to sub to be basically the touring the touring bass player while the other guy had remained as working on songs and recording with them. <clears throat> and that that situation lasted for many, most of those 10 years. And then finally near the end I think the other guys in the band just got tired of having to rehearse with two guys <laughs> having to basically rehearse twice as much working with the original bass player to get things ready and then working with me to get ready to go on tour. So eventually I just came into the band at near the end of my tenure as the bass player and you know, then there was a situation. My mom was, my mom had cancer and was, I was her at home caretaker. And those guys wanted to play some shows and I, I just couldn't, I just couldn't. So I stepped down and let them hire somebody else. Yeah. No, I remember you told me that, but you don't do anything with them anymore. Like no, somebody else fills nope. their shoes. Yeah, they they brought in a totally a totally new guy. Okay, which is fine. I don't uh, right now. You know that all happened in quick succession. Was everything with uh, with my mom, and she passed away, and a couple of months later we were in pandemic, and I I'll be honest with you, the pandemic had turned me basically. Uh, into a recluse <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. I'm totally fine. I'm totally fine with it. I'm totally fine with it. I'm really enjoying not going and doing anything right now. Well, I remember there's this meme. It had like Marilyn Manson written up against like a, like a curtain. And he's like, I've been waiting for this my whole life. <laughs> and I remember I said that to my girl. She's like, that's me. So did, it, did that push you into more writing? When you're like trapped in your house and you couldn't, you couldn't travel, you couldn't tour. It, you know, I well, I had a lot going on right then because my my mom had just passed away, and I had to deal with all of 
all the paperwork and all of her material things. And I'm really just getting through that now. Now, after going through all of her personal effects and taking care of everything with the estate. And I just sold her house this past June, but uh, a new house, my house here and settled in. So the last couple of years have been pretty crazy <clears throat> and I've done some writing, not extensive though. And basically no music in that period of time. When would you say um, the majority of your writing was done? Was it done before you were in a band? Was it, you know, a little bit in between? Like, when it was, was it? It was done, uh, they were done very much at the same time <clears throat> where I'd be writing some evenings and rehearsing other evenings. Yeah, so I'd, I'd, go ahead. Yeah, the, mo the majority of it was taking place <clears throat> at exactly the same time. Okay. Yeah, I remember, like, my wife done a hit and run, and I remember at first, like, it's, you don't feel like doing anything. You feel like everything's, like, you know, everything's on downward spiral. But then it kind of uh, made me feel like life is short. You got to you gotta get stuff done. You got to get stuff out there. Because nobody really cares if you make it except for you. So I, I think that helped, like, push me forward. It is, I mean, uh, honestly, doing this... <clears throat> Doing this helps to inspire me, especially to do some do some writing. I believe after the last time we spoke, I we finished our conversation, and I immediately <laughs> I immediately sat down and got to work on something. But I, uh, you know, I've really come to feel like my downtime is just as important, maybe even more important than my productive time. <clears throat> like I've really let the pressure off of myself to be productive. I think for many years, I really hope to turn the corner in such a way that I could be earning even a meager living off of uh, my creative work. But at this point, I kind of look at it and go that would it would be miraculous and I don't know if I'm really needing to pursue it in such in that way anymore. So now I just am doing it almost more for my personal enjoyment rather than trying to get a lot of work out there. It's it's tough I think uh, especially as a well, either, either way, you know, whether you're making music or writing or making art, it, you almost really have to be very prolific to, to make a, a decent amount of money. You know, most writers I see who are doing well are pushing out a novel every few months. And there's absolutely no way I could do that, you know, or, or, or if you're in a band, you're playing a lot of shows. Or if you're an artist, you're 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 creating a lot of you're making no, a lot I of. I know paintings. a lot of bands make their money off touring, like they don't yeah. make it off of album sales. Yeah, not anymore. Anymore, it's really tough. You know, everybody's streaming, and you don't really make hardly any money streaming. And yeah, you got to hit the road, which is really a lot of fun. But once again, you reach a certain age and. You need the right situation. You need a significant other who is fine with you being gone the majority <laughs> of the time. You need to be healthy enough to probably not have insurance if you're in the U.S. You, it, it's tough. It's a lot of fun, though. I do not regret a moment of the time when I was uh, – on the road out on tour with Metallica. Those were some really, really good, good times. Essentially a, a you know, a two month long party. I, that last tour ended, I was really disappointed to, to be going back home. <laughs> <laughs> it seems not to, you know, change topics, but it seems like as far as writing, like at one point, 
you know, it seemed like you didn't have to put out a lot. Well, first, everybody put out a lot because they got paid by the works, like with all this pulp magazines and everything, like Doc Savage and The Shadow and The Spider and all that stuff. You know, and then it seemed like they kind of got to the, you know, like the era where it was like, if you put on a good, strong story, that might carry you through. Like, you know, like Richard Matheson or Stephen King or anything like it, I mean, it's also partially on who sees it. Like maybe you luck into the right time, right place, all that sort of stuff. But it seems like now lately, I like to talk to people and the ones that have made a full time career off of just writing are extremely prolific. So, you know, they, they have, like you said, they have a novel coming out like every three months, which I can't do. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, there was a if you go back to the pulp time. You know, back to the time when people were writing pulps, they were actually making almost the same money per word as what is being offered now. <laughs> and the That's and the sad. cost of everything was so much lower. Oh, of course. That yeah. you, you could actually make a, a living just scrapping out short stories. Right. But I mean, that was a long time ago. And then. It wasn't, uh, it was during the pandemic. I was watching a, a virtual convention panel, and I think it was uh, Brian Keene, David Scow, um, uh, John, John Skip, and uh, I'm sorry, the, the last uh, writer escapes me right at the moment but they were doing this panel and they were talking specifically about uh writing in the 80s and they were giving me you know i definitely got the impression that the phenomenon of stephen king after that happened that a lot of the big publishers were offering decent contracts to writers hoping to you know catch lightning in a bottle and if you were writing at that time, it wasn't nearly as difficult as it is now. It was to, kind of like the Nirvana effect, but with publishers instead of like music companies. R- right. To, but, it, you know, Nirvana, you know, kind of basically creating, not creating, but really pushing grunge right. to the forefront, where if you were playing that kind of music, you're going to get a record deal because of their success. And I, I mean, I think the same thing probably happened with, you know, 80s hair bands where right. you end up with somebody like Motley Crue doing really well and suggestively everybody wants to jump on the bandwagon and do the same thing. But now it's uh it's more difficult and you see a lot of people going the self-publishing route and like you said they push out a a novel every two or three months, they constantly have new work out. So if somebody reads it and they're a fan, they can go back and buy all their all their other work and actually create a income stream like that. But I I am not prolific like that. I don't plan on becoming prolific like that. I I enjoy writing and I enjoy writing the way I am doing it right now. I don't know if I would want to I worry that I would enjoy it less if I had a ton of pressure to crank out a certain amount to make money. Yeah. Uh, you know, that said, you do occasionally see somebody who just has one novel that's a huge breakout right. and everybody everybody reads it and they make a ton of money off of, you know, or get a movie deal or whatever. That's always a possibility just like winning the lottery is a possibility right. <laughs> but but you can't plan on you know you a can't just possibility but a possibility right right but you can't you can't base your life on your retirement can't plan shouldn't be <laughs> my next novel is gonna s- sell 10 million copies <laughs> but it could happen it could happen right well there are a lot of people too they get screwed over by publishing companies like and there's a lot of people all these days are just putting it like out on a Kindle and putting it out themselves. You no, know, because like, like I have a publisher and my publisher is really good, but they get a percentage of what it sells for on Amazon, then they give me a percentage of the percentage they get. So it's like trickling down to I, me. 
I think it also helps in terms of self publishing that you can still make money putting your product at a very low price point. Right. Where a publishers really can't do that. So people are willing to take a risk on a Kindle book for two ninety nine. And if they like it, that's great. And if they don't like it, it's no big deal. It's only two ninety nine. But then you jump up to, you know, even a small press, it's like five ninety nine or six ninety nine for a Kindle edition. And people are probably a little less willing to throw that money out for something that they're not sure that they're going to enjoy. Well, well, there is that point. There's also like, I kind of debate this. Um, like when I do conventions and I sell stuff and I wonder how I should price stuff. Um, if you price it very low, people assume that it's lower quality. Like I, I know when uh, the Japanese first came out with like VCRs, you know, and they priced them way below what like Phillips would or, you know, some other American company. People are like, oh, it's cheap Japanese junk. And then they pulled off the market, doubled the price, put it back on the market, and it sold like hotcakes. People are like, oh, well, it's more expensive. It must be quality. Well, I mean, luckily, if you're, if you're you know, self-publishing or something on, say, for instance, Kindle, you can always experiment with that. Right. You know, you can go in and on a whim decide to change your price point right see what happens if it if it doesn't work you could change it back or whatever you want to do well that would be kind of hard to like have a lower price and then up it <laughs> it'd be easier to have a higher price and lower it well you never know though you never know <laughs> i I, never I think know. uh early on in uh kindle it was uh Man, I'm terrible with names. Um, uh, Conrath, Joe Conrath had, uh, you know, he had gotten really fortunate because he had a bunch of uh, trunk novels that he hadn't been able to sell just laying around. And it was right when Kindle first started and uh, he decided to put these novels on Kindle. These were novels that he was giving away on his website that you could read for free. But then Kindle came and he was like, well, I'll uh, I'll I'll see what happens. I'll put them on there and see what happens. Well, they ended up doing really great for him. And I believe he did that several times, tried different experiments of raising the price or lowering the ring, the price to see how that would affect uh, his sales numbers. I, you know, <clears throat> he had very lucky, was very fortunate in terms of timing because I think he jumped on there when a lot of the bigger publishers were still not sure about going uh, with digital. And so I, he actually made a, a pretty much a killing selling his eBooks initially. Right. Well, Ray time and place obviously does a lot. <laughs> like the yeah, guy who yeah, invented yeah. the slinky made millions of dollars. Right. <laughs> it's not right. like he has some genius invention. He just, you know, the guy who made the pet rock. He didn't even invent anything. He just labeled it the pet rock. And he right. made millions off that. The guy who came up with shark NATO. <laughs> <laughs> so do you is do you have a preferred way, like a preferred way of like uh advertising your stuff? Do you have a uh, like a, a way I, to get out there? I have, uh, with my first novel, Fauna, I do I do Kindle ads. Okay. Which I, I don't think it's really increased the amount of money I may, would make, mm -hmm. but it's increased the number of people who see the book. Okay. Because I end up... What is like Kindle Direct, so they give it away for free, but there's more exposure. No, no, you just pay for if you go on uh, Amazon and you're looking for a book. Usually, they have the book there, and then underneath it, there's a row of other books that are like sponsored products. But that's what you pay for with the ad: is that your book will appear in that row underneath the the book that whoever clicked on was looking for, <laughs> and 
if uh, it actually, I mean, gets a lot more views because of those. And what you do is every time somebody clicks on your book, you end up uh, paying Amazon like a few cents, like whatever, 20 cents every yeah, time somebody it, looks on it. promo for you. And uh, like I said, I would probably make the same amount of money just having it on there. But because of the ads, I end up having a lot more people actually reading it. I'm just not making any more money because a <laughs> larger percentage of money goes back to them. But at this point, I would, I'm completely happy just getting my name out there and having people actually reading it. So I have no, I have no complaints in terms of that. I don't, I can't think of another way that I could, uh, I know a lot of friends of mine really like uh, BookBub, which is another service that you pay. They send out you an know, email. With them, I heard it's actually really hard to get a promotion on BookBub, like it's, to get your book promoted. Like and they're not cheap. They they charge no. like seven hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah. But like yeah. even just to get it featured on BookBub, it's like yeah, I get a lot. Yeah, but if if you can get it on there, and I think you can keep resubmitting it every month mm -hmm. and, until they they're interested or not if you you know take that effort but but I've heard well I've heard basically the same thing you pay a lot of money but it, it'll push your book up you know potentially into the top 10 right sellers on on uh, Amazon for a you know a short time as long as the the uh they're putting it out that that week or whatever you'll really increase your sales numbers and you'll probably make some money but not as much money as you would have if you hadn't given them eight hundred dollars <laughs> to put your right. book but kind of like in that principle of yeah. like you know any publicity is good publicity you know that might just having more views might help the sales of your next book well right and i think that's that's the whole thing is if you and, you know, once again, this goes along with being a prolific creator is if you get a book bub on a book and you have, you know, five, six, seven, eight other books that are that are already finished and, and out there. If somebody likes the first one, they, they might, might turn around and, then yeah. and buy all the other ones. And right. then you're actually making money without paying for the ad. You know, like the ad. Well, you know where you're going to make all that money? Like, when you get really old and you're like two years from death, that's when all of a sudden you'll break. You know, like, then they'll make like a Game of Thrones and suddenly everybody <laughs> wants to check out your work, even though you've been putting yourself out for decades. You know, I would be fine with that. I have two daughters <laughs> and they could you have all the them. money. Yeah, they could have the money. That would be great. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty happy now. I don't feel... I don't feel like being wealthy is something that I really would would need to make me happier. I don't I don't think it would make me happier. It might make me worry more about money. Well, I uh, like Joe Rogan's concept on it. Like if you have enough money that you can, you know, buy what you want, then it's called fuck you money. You can do whatever the fuck you want and you don't really care. I I think uh, a lot of the the trick is, is, and I and I've been here uh, in the past many times. But if you <clears throat> are like bogged down in debt, and you're really struggling in terms of the amount of income you have coming in, you know, being able to, you know, if you're just barely getting by, it's really hard to be positive. But no, if you, yeah. you, but once, but if you have enough. If you have enough, even if it's just enough and you're in decent shape, then, uh, you know, it's it's not uh, it's not that hard to be in a good, good headspace. I definitely don't need millions of dollars to be happy. I, obviously, I, I, I wouldn't turn it down. <laughs> I wouldn't turn it down. But if it doesn't happen, I'll, I'll be fine with that. Right. So do you have a have you you started writing again? Like you said that uh, the first time I interviewed you in uh, 
just so everyone knows, uh, we did the interview with you and Zoom fucked up, so <laughs> none of it was safe. Yeah, but you take said two. That, that helped inspire you to start writing again, or that it helped inspire you to like push a project forward? What, what, now, what is this? It, it's like, are you saying that like the talking to me the first time helped to like, you know, inspire oh, I, you oh, to like oh, get oh, back to a project you were working absolutely, on? Absolutely. Absolutely. Whenever I uh, spend time with other writers, or I, I know you just came back from from Killer Con. Right. Going to a convention was always a great way to get me excited about, you know, really excited about writing for a while. You kind of ride that wave or no, you when I do. talk to other <clears throat> when I talk to other writers, uh, I've been writing collaboratively with my friend uh, Bill W.D. Gagliani. I'll refer to him as Bill <laughs> <laughs> going forward. But we've been collaborating for about 15 years on fiction and you know whenever we get together and and talk it always helps you know we have we have our little group here uh bill and i are in milwaukee uh our friend mark zerbel who writes uh bizarro is up here in milwaukee and we have a couple close friends uh in chicago john everson and brian pinkerton and so we get together, we've done zoom things and sometimes we get together and hang out and that always, after hanging out with those guys, you can always expect a, a good, a productive period afterwards, just because you get kind of more excited about it. Yeah, no, definitely. Like, like I'll, I'll do what uh, I've even at comic cons, like you know, sell my art and sell my books and unfortunately, at Comic Cons, it, if it's not comic books, they don't buy it. But it's like you're just around so many, you know, creative talents that, that you're like, I want to do more. They're like it, it really gives you that push. Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, that's that's good. It's it's been a while since I've been to any uh, done any conventioning, but you know, you never know that might uh, it might come up again. Even if it's a even if it's a small group and you're just hanging out talking about writing or art or music or whatever you do it generally yeah it helps to uh inspire you okay well switching topics just a little bit um let, let's talk about like agents and publishers for a minute because i know some people like it's almost like like a badge of honor like they will tell you like 10 times in a row about how great their agent and their publisher is you know but like, I don't have an agent. I know people that have had agents that didn't do anything for them. And I know people that have had agents that did, that did a lot for them. They broke a lot of boundaries. And I know that if you want to get on any of the big book publishers, like Tor Books or Penguin Books, something like that, you need an agent to approach them. But then again, that also might be, you know, like half good, half bad, because those people might keep a huge percentage. And, you know, like... There, there are a lot of bands, like a lot of indie bands that signed to major labels, but they made more money on the indie labels than they did on the major labels. Yeah, it's hard to say. It's hard, it's hard to get an agent. I think an agent is like everything else. If they're, if they're good, if they can sell your work, they're, it's great to have one. But you can also have an agent who's, who still can't place your work who doesn't really do anything for you. And I, and I think in terms of that, money. <laughs> well, I think if you, if you get an agent and they are unable to sell your work, they really are not going to spend a lot of time on you. Right. You know, so uh, I would definitely, uh, you know, if, if the opportunity was there, I would, I would definitely get an agent if I could. But uh, just to be able to reach some uh, some of those bigger publishers, like you said, but uh, it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, having an agent doesn't necessarily mean you're going to, you know, walk away with a pot of gold. That's for sure. Uh, and I don't know. It's so it's so hard to say whether you're talking about music or writing if something's going to be good for you 
or not. You just have to see, you know, there are, like you said, there are bands that do great just selling their own, being completely independent and selling their work. And there are also writers who do great selling their own work. Uh, I can't remember the name of the author, but uh, a few, uh, you know, time gets slippery, but, but I know uh, there's a book series called wool. It was like a science fiction series. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it, it had done so well on Kindle that, I mean, I think he was offered a multi-million dollar deal from a major publisher that he, I I think he turned it down (laughs) because he was making so much money on his own that he was afraid that he would actually end up, uh, you know, making less money. money. Yeah. Losing money going with a publisher. And I, I was at a convention in Illinois. It was not specifically a horror convention. Uh, Maybe it was, Capricorn or something. It was more probably more geared towards science fiction and fantasy. But there was a, a writer there who he had turned down a publishing deal because they would not put his work on Kindle Unlimited, and he was making most of his money uh, on as selling on for Kindle. Right, uh, and and he turned down the he turned down the deal. Yeah, well, I, I know none of my publishers were willing to put it on Kindle Unlimited because they basically don't make any money off it. You know, when, when it, like, what you hope is you hope it gives them, like, kind of a preview to your work so they buy more of your work, but some people don't look at it that way. I know, especially well, publishers. <laughs> I, I was going to say, my self-published first novel, uh, Fauna, the, most of the money that comes comes off of uh kindle unlimited sales and it's not bad you get paid uh by the by pages read so and i i think it ends up being about half a cent per page read which really doesn't is very close to the same amount of money i make off of uh, actual kindle books sold but a lot more people read it on Kindle Unlimited. Okay. Because for them, it's, you know, they pay whatever a $10 a month fee. And if, if they are voracious readers, it makes a lot of sense because there's a lot of material on there. And after you pay your $10, $10 a month, it's, it's free. Right. You know, anything on there is free. So, but it does, it does not, uh, I mean, it pays something. It's not. It's it's not like the authors don't make money if somebody reads it off Kindle Unlimited. You still are making money, and I would say at least two thirds of the money I make off the sale of that book are off Kindle Unlimited reads. No, it's a good thing to think about. Like um, I had seven short stories out, and. I remember they were all selling pretty well and then I collected them into one novel and a publisher put them out and now I make way less money off sales of that, you know, collection of short stories from the publisher than I did off the individual stories on Kindle. And I'm guessing you were probably selling those individual stories for 99 cents yes. each or right. And, and now they sold the, like hotcakes. Right. And now the collection is like six ninety nine. Yeah. Or if, yeah, six ninety nine or six ninety five or something like that. Yeah. Right. Well, I think people are way more willing to take a risk to drop ninety nine cents to see if to see if they'll like something than they are to drop six six ninety nine. Right. No, you know, and especially with people like you or me who are not household names. You know, right. we're you know of very obscure writers. Yeah, I imagine a lot of people look at you know six ninety nine, five ninety nine, and don't want to don't want to take a risk with that much money when they well, can they buy would, someone they know for that cents. much. Yeah. yeah, for ninety nine cents, it's almost nothing. For Kindle Unlimited, you pay for the service, so it's basically you can pick whatever you want, right? Yeah, yeah, it's like it's like streaming. You know, okay. you pay 
you pay your ten dollars a month and any author whose books are available on Kindle Unlimited can then you can then read their work for free. Okay. But I think I've you know kind of keeping an eye on my sales. There have definitely been people who start reading it on Kindle Unlimited and then actually turn around and buy it. Oh, nice. Yeah. You know, where they read a part of it, they're like, oh, I, I like this. I think it's worth actually buying a hard a hard copy to have on my shelf, and then they pay for it. Yeah, I don't know. You know, the, uh, it's really uh, a horse apiece sometimes going with the small – press i it definitely still means something that you've been that a, you know a gatekeeper has let you in right you know because it, anybody can self-publish it, so it becomes really hard to tell if that's going to be quality or not but if you go through a publisher even if it's a small press publisher you know that someone who who knows what they're doing has read it and enjoyed it and pushed it out but it's it's really hard to say. I mean, if it's a publishing house that maybe has like a really de- dedicated following and people will buy anything that comes out by that publisher. But I think that's really rare now, too. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Like, it seems to have changed a lot. Because at one point, if it came out with whatever the label was, like, I, I'm a comic book guy. So I remember there are comic books that would come out like, like Dark Horse Comics everything that came out from dark horse you want to check out it might be crap but you're willing to at least check it out you know and, and now it doesn't seem like that really happened it's more like uh who wrote that for you you know have i heard of them before like there, right. there's not that there there's not that willingness of people to try well and there's so there's so much out there right. there's so much out there that it's uh you don't have to you know, that's uh, the struggle with a lot of indie bands out there, too, where it's yeah, that's the thing you are of. you are a drop in the ocean. It's very, you know, and even if what you're producing is great, it's tough to have people find that drop in the ocean, you know, which is why you go with a big record label or a big publisher, because, you know, then then you've got Oprah Winfrey telling people to look at your stuff and instantly that's huge huge publicity if you right. get you know if you can get that going on you're you got your you got it made well i remember when anything that came out from am rep like i like a lot of the bands that were on am rep like big black and helmet and stuff like that so anything that came out from am rep i'd at least check it out you know when someone coming out on the sst i at least check it out you know, I don't know that there's anything like that anymore, you know, label, band label wise, you know, book publisher wise. You know, yeah, when I was, when, I think when I was a kid, it was Metal Blade. Yeah, I, I remember Metal Blade, yeah. <laughs> and Roadrunner, you know. And right. There, there were all these labels, you know, whether they were music labels or book labels or comic labels, where like they seem to have like a quality control. And now it just seems like it's so diverse and you know, like, that doesn't fit my taste anymore. Well, t- times have definitely changed, you know, and I don't know, uh, you know, I mean, I think it probably helped, you know, going back and talking about, you know, Metal Blade Records is I was a lot younger then, you know, so I was really into, you know, me and my group of friends were really into things like that. And I, I guess I've, I guess I've gotten old <laughs> as time has gone on. So, so I just don't dig like I used to. And I think the kids now uh, maybe are not into that as much as they were, you know, they're into very different things. You know, they're probably into indie games and watching. I, I think it's fascinating that like when I was in high school, it was, really the height of MTV. Right. And I think every... I remember when MTV played only music. (laughs) Right, right, exactly. (laughs) And I think because of that, like every single person I was in high school with wanted to be in a band, at least at some point. At least some point they wanted to play music, they wanted to sing, they wanted to be in a band. 
And I think kids now want to be uh, like a internet influencer. influencer. Right. Yeah. They want to be a, a, a TikTok star or yeah. a, or a, like a hit, Paul Logan uh, or <laughs> yeah, or a you know a streamer, a Twitch streamer. Yeah, it's like a very different thing going on r- right now. But, the, you know, which is time, so, I think by the time you get there, you know, somebody else like by the time that you realize, oh, they're making a lot of money, I'll do it. Somebody else has already worn it out for you. So now the people oh, yeah. are trying to be the Jake Paul or Paul Logan, you know. Those guys already, you know, ran it through the ringer. There are they made their fortunes off it, but you're not going to. Yeah, yeah, no, I don't. I don't chase it, whether it's uh, music or writing, because those same things happen. Where all of a sudden, everybody's got vampire novels out, <laughs> and I look at it and I go, "By the time I finish, or zombie, it, right, or zombie," and it's like, "By the time I finish it." The wave will be gone, right? Or, or it'll, or there'll be so many people who've done it that once again it'll be just a drop in the bucket. So, I mean, I think you really need to to do your own thing and just see what happens. And you know, if the gods smile upon you, so well, be it. I, and if not, that's a that's okay. It doesn't bother me because I've I mean I've known plenty of, uh, you know, I've read plenty of writers and listened to plenty of music that that never that never got huge you know that was always marginalized but that doesn't that doesn't mean its quality has been reduced at all you know that uh talent and fame and fortune do not go hand in hand and you can find plenty of short stories and novels by writers who you've never heard before and you read it and it completely blows you away and you're like why why have it why is this person not huge and successful and they die pitiless of cancer like HP Lovecraft and yeah. suddenly you know the property's worth millions and millions of dollars, but he never saw its end of it. But you know, that's uh and, and you know you know it happens musically too. I mean any Whoever's listening to this, where whatever town you're in, you can guarantee <laughs> there's a fantastic band playing in some bar in your town or nearby that's maybe just as good or better than some huge band right. but the, but they're playing in a club and only a handful of people go see them that doesn't mean they're not great though yeah it just well, means nobody not many people know I remember my art teacher told me he's like who do you like i was like i'm really a fan of frank frazetta and he goes, well, for every Frazetta, you know, there were 10 people that were better than him. They just never made it. Right. So there's a lot out there. I wish there yeah. was like more of like, like, I like the way that you can like listen to bands a little bit on like, say, Amazon before you purchase CD, you know, before you purchase CD. You know, I, I like it when if they have like a little bit of the book that you can read before you buy the book. So you, you kind of have more of like a, like there's so much out there, it gives you a little bit of a tip of whether or not it's worth your money and worth your time. I still, and th- this may be just me being old school, but f- with bands and writers, frequently I discover it from tips, tips from my friends who, who you know, maybe on social media are like, hey, you got to check this out. This is great. Or, you know, they post a link to something and, and I'm like, well, I like I, I like that person's taste. I uh, so I'll, so I'll check it out. You know, I we've agreed on things in the past, so if they like it, it's probably pretty good. I feel like that's a better metric than following a, like a specific genre. Like you know, like if you're like, oh well, I really liked uh, Dawn of the Dead, so I'm gonna follow zombies. There's a lot of crap out there. So yes, yes. <laughs> you you know, or hey, I really like Nirvana, so I'm gonna see what else kind of falls in the same genre. Again, you might end up with Creed. <laughs> you might. You might, you never know. <laughs> of course, Creed made a lot of money. Yeah, well I, I have nothing good to say about Creed, but <laughs> no, but they did, they make, did a make a lot of money. Yeah. Well they were hugely successful for whatever two or three records. <laughs> 
<laughs> Did, didn't he uh didn't he beat his wife and he got I, I don't know. There was like I don't know, any of that super religious stuff. I, I just like like you're probably already like living a confused lifestyle. Uh yeah, I, I did actually watch something not long ago on YouTube. I occasionally watch these videos on musicians and what happened to him. Apparently that <laughs> apparently that guy had a very rough childhood. Right. Like a very rough childhood and was pretty messed up. And it probably didn't help. I mean, most people who get famous really fast are a little bit messed up by it. Right. So I, I well, I'm I, Axel Rose. I mean, I think he's a great singer, but he had a lot of fucked up stuff in his childhood before he made it. Yeah. Yeah. And well, and then all of a sudden having, you know, every person you meet telling you how great you are probably does some things to your ego that make you unpleasant to hang around <laughs> at least for a few years until you get over yourself. <laughs> Like, well, you still think you're you're into this shit, and you're walking the holy water, and yeah. But all right, so what what do you have going on now? You're, you're saying that you're inspired to start writing again. Do you have a project coming out soon? I well, Bill and I have created this uh, this kind of pulp western character named uh, Rex Masters. And there will be two Rex Masters short stories published this year, uh, both in anthologies. One anthology is called Fistful of Demons, and the other one is the latest so installment in the story Snap in an anthology. It is, yeah. They they both are in weird Western anthologies. That one, the one is uh, called like fistful of demons and the other one is the net the latest installment in the snafu series uh dead or alive it's called and uh so this character rex masters is kind of you know, basically like a classic pulp character from you know from back in the 40s or whatever like uh solomon kane I think mm -hmm. was Robert Howard's Western pulp character, but it's, it's very similar to that kind of uh, something like uh, Conan or, you know, Fofford and the gray mouser or Elric where it's a character where though, where we're right working on a number of short stories, all featuring this character in the old West, a old a version of the old West where, fighting demons is not that <laughs> unusual. So that's coming up soon. And Bill and I also have a collaborative novel that's finished that we are looking for a publisher for it right now. That's called Acolytes of the Dead. And it's yeah, right. more or less a Egyptian themed erotic Gothic horror novel. Uh, yeah, right. I don't, I don't want to give too much away because it's one of those novels that really reads like a mystery where you, until at the end when everything comes together, you'll probably be scratching your head a little bit. But it's it's got some extreme adult content in it. So if you uh, enjoy that, you should enjoy it. You should uh, check out my uh, current publisher, which I can't say enough good stuff about, Trosser Press. They they definitely might be interested in that. Uh, that maybe we'll uh, maybe we'll send that to. Uh, maybe that will be our next. Our so next I, I think one submission. of the main guys behind it is David Wilson. You can see him. He has a Facebook page, but it's called oh, Crossroad yeah. Press. Yeah, I think Bill. I think Bill has a couple novels at Crossroad already. I think his. Uh, his Nick Lupo novels uh, ended up there. So we will definitely keep that in mind. If uh, the current houses that have it sitting on their shelf decide they don't want it. <laughs> so, yeah, well, I've, this that's the fourth publisher I've gone through. And it's the first one that I feel really gave me a fair shake. 
Like, you know, they, they, they put it out there, they pay me on time, they pay what they're, they do what they say they're going to do. I mean, you still, with any small press, you kind of have to do your own promotion. Right. That's kind of a given. Yeah, that that's the way it is now. I mean, I think even in some of the larger presses, you really need to, uh, I mean, I've seen some small presses where right, right in their submission guidelines are like, yeah, we not only do we want the pitch for your book, but we want the pitch for your promotion, your promotional pitch yeah, right. also. No, I've had that. Like, they will specifically ask you, how are you going to promote this book? Right. <laughs> and, and well, it makes thing, sense. It's their money too. That's how yeah, they're that's making true. their money too. So, so I well, get. Well, if they go bankrupt, then you know they're the one fucked. Often they'll have you know stuff like the house on the line. So it can really screw them hardcore. I mean, I understand. You know, it, it's, it's kind of the way the the, the market now. You know, they, like nothing nothing's guaranteed. But um, one thing that I like to do is um, I like to do um, like short videos for my books. I hope that gives people a feel for them. Have you have you you know tried in that? Have you ventured into that? I have not. That's not really in my skill set. Okay. V- video well, they're, they're- making. I could probably do a very rudimentary one, but <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know if that would help sales or just make people. Uh, well, I, I can recommend people to you. I don't make them myself because I you know, they would suck and nobody would buy my novel. <laughs> but I have a couple of people that well, I mean they they're not free, but they're not super expensive, you know. And I'll make a video, and I'm like, wow, that looks really cool. You know, it's kind of like a, like a little movie trailer or something, you know, before you book. Yeah, I've seen, I mean, I've seen book trailers and I've seen some really good ones and some that were I've seen not, some really bad not, ones too. not <laughs> as good, but you know, other than that, trying to get them, uh, trying to get books in your hands of people who will, you know, write reviews and review them and make sure to post those reviews around and hopefully get some people to see it. Uh, it's definitely it's definitely tough. It's definitely tough. You need, uh, you know. Well, I've heard. I haven't tried it, but I've heard that Amazon ads do a lot of all the like streaming platforms and stuff. The one that does the most, I hear, are Amazon ads. Well, like I said, it's it's been pretty good for me in terms of. We're not Amazon. I'm sorry, Facebook reading. ads, rather. Oh, Facebook ads. Yeah. yeah, that I have not tried. I have not tried Facebook ads. Um. It would probably be worth a shot. It would probably be worth a shot. I, I think. Depending. I think somebody was explaining it to me, and they were saying like, you know, you, you can decide like the population is going to reach, and you can you know you spend according to what population you want to reach. But like you can like choose ten thousand people or twenty thousand people or whatever, and you know they'll they'll put it up for like a week or they'll put it up for two weeks. You also you know choose the duration of it. And supposedly that helps because everybody, unfortunately, <laughs> looks at Facebook. I uh, yeah. Well, I would I would definitely consider trying that on my next. Uh, I am currently working on kind of a old school lost island of the dinosaurs <laughs> novel, <laughs> and when that's done, yeah, maybe I maybe I will try uh, Facebook ads. Assuming Facebook is still around, things things change so quick. You know, you never know when all of a sudden it might just. Well, the whole move world. To, might everybody move to a different. Everybody <laughs> so, might move to a different platform. You know. Yeah, yeah. Or we get nuked. You know. Yeah. Imagine if you got a MySpace ad and then suddenly it's Facebook. <laughs> well, you know, if we if we get nuked, people need things to do in their bunkers. It's so true. maybe reading will really take off. I don't know if they'll have access to it though. Like, oh. wow, it looks like a really cool novel by Dave, but, you know, how am I going to fucking get it? Because I don't dare open the hatch because I'll uh, die. Right, right. <laughs> well, you know, that's what ebooks are for. That's what ebooks are for. <laughs> yeah, but that's if you have an internet. What if all that stuff yeah. is down? Yeah, well, well, I guess you have satellites then, so you could, like, you know, maybe yeah, where the radiation is, you go set up the little, you know, the little dish and... <laughs> Don't I gotta say, way. I'm definitely not expecting a nuclear war anytime <laughs> soon. But you, but you never know, right? Right. 
I don't know. Maybe Ukraine goes sideways. Yeah, I mean, who who the fuck knows? You yeah, know? I mean, of course you're in you're in New York, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you'll probably be a prime target. I'm in Milwaukee. I don't think they're going to be nuking Milwaukee anytime soon. But yeah, thanks, man, for doing this interview. Um, is there yeah, anywhere awesome, else uh, people can reach you? Can they look at your current projects? Uh. You know, I'd just say probably check out my Amazon pa- page. I think I think I sent uh I think I sent your video guy uh a link Bobby, yeah. to uh Bobby's to the band. Awesome. And uh yeah, that's about it. If you go to the you know, the Amazon page should have uh whatever my work is and whatever's coming up will eventually pop up on there. Okay, and what should we look for next? We should look for those collaboration short stories or the uh, full yeah, novel. Yeah, I would say definitely the Rex Masters Weird Western anthologies because I think I think they're both slated to be out in October. Okay, so it's close enough. If the world right. doesn't end, you know. Yeah, even if it is, if you have that satellite dish, you know, maybe no, we're going to make help. it. We're going to make it to Halloween. <laughs> The world can't end before Halloween. <laughs> well, I have a convention to do on Halloween, so I hope not. <laughs> well, right, right. We're, we're going to be fine. We're going to be fine. <laughs> Crush fingers. Yeah.